Thank you. Live people. Welcome everyone. Call the meeting to order. Any public comment? Seeing none, moving on. Approval of the minutes from the May 4th meeting. Any comments, thoughts? I read the room earlier. I didn't see any corrections. I apologize. I sent out two what copies. I, what I thought were the correct ones, and then Terry caught something that I didn't catch, so she sent out the correct ones. Seven members, not eight members that can vote here. <laughs> Is there a motion to approve? So we'll make that motion. Seconded. Second. All so those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Moving on. Chair report, uh, Lily can't be uh, with us to start the meeting. She may make it uh, towards the end. Um, but um, on the Walk Bike Northampton form, uh, that is tonight at 6.30, just after our meeting. Uh, I am not able to attend that one. However, I can report on the, uh, on the Main Street uh, one that uh, happened earlier. Uh, can anyone here attend the meeting later tonight at 6.30? I'm going to be gone. You're going to be gone? Oh, yes. You can represent our interests with vigor. <laughs> Represented quite well the last time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they definitely uh, got the got the got the message. Um, I attended the the Main Street uh, kind of redesign workshop. Yeah, uh, and that was kind of fun. They went over some various elements of what makes a, a Main Street vibrant and important, and certainly uh, street trees were part of them. They then we then broke it out into groups and had uh, plan view maps and also section maps yeah. uh, or plans. Uh, of uh, Main Street at three points, uh, where you know it varies in width quite a bit. Uh, the right of way does, um, and then there were um, little cutouts of various elements of a street: travel lanes, parking, street furniture, uh, various width sidewalks, street trees, etc. Um, and then people got to kind of lay them out uh, in the sectional, um, and then you know try to imagine what it would look like across the the entire plan view of, of Main Street. Um, and in our group, which met here, pretty much all of them had uh, multiple uh, additions of shade trees. A lot of them put uh, a landscaped uh, island in the middle. Um, but, uh, you know, everyone widened the sidewalk and reduced and cut a travel lane. Um, and uh, so it was an interesting scenario. And I think some of those results may be given tonight. Um, but also tonight, there, it's going to be more about um, kind of, uh, they have, after the listening of the first workshop, they went and updated the maps of existing conditions and needs and that type of thing. Um, and I hope they don't get too bogged down in those specifics because everyone's going to zero in on their house and think it about their neighborhood. Um, but hopefully uh, they're going to do another kind of 30,000 foot view about certain parameters, certain guidelines, and also the, the priorities of the town, kind of where, where decisions have to be, be made. What are, what are going to be some of the priorities versus widening streets, versus more sidewalks, versus street trees, and that type of thing. So looking at the priority structure was going to be, I think, the focus tonight. One thing with the, with, when you do it on a, a cross-section, uh, you know, you start to, especially as it narrows down, you have to start prioritizing. When you have the 140-foot right away, you know, you can pretty much do anything you want. Uh, but as Main Street narrows down, uh, you saw some people, uh, you know, make, starting to make that decision-making process around those priorities. Was Was there anybody not represented there that you feel like? Uh, there weren't a lot of businesses actually. Uh, the retail uh, business owners. There were probably only three um, in the whole uh, workshop. Is that because they've already spoken? Or? Uh, mm, no, That's I don't know why, but. Um, there was a write-up in the paper today, I think about the walk, pet there, but street trees were noticed, or were mentioned as a priority. I think it was from the, maybe it was from the, from the last one, and they were talking about this one, but it was, it was Yeah, they might be trying to drum up. Yeah, but it was, tonight. it was, they kind of said people are interested in this, 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 and this, and street trees definitely were, shade trees were definitely like, prominent on the list there. 
Um, I can. I know that uh, Damon Road, I guess, is at 25% completion, and I'm hoping that design can make it through some eyes of the tree warden and perhaps this committee. I, hopefully, it's, I have not seen uh, any plans. Okay. Per se. I haven't seen anything actually. Well, I know it's for a sidewalk on the. I guess it eventually becomes the south side of the street. So left heading towards Pride. Yes. I think side all the way to Route Nine. Yeah. Or at least to the bike path. At that point. It'd be great to see that. I mean, that again, it, I think, is a prime example of a street in desperate need of some street trees, especially as it makes that bend towards the railway tracks. No one's so going to want to walk on that if it's just 40 mile an hour traffic and then a sidewalk. But um, is the or two uh, mile an hour traffic going the other way? <laughs> is the is the sidewalk going to be on the um, bike path side or is it going to be on the the uh, Ford side? I think it's going to be on the Ford side. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. South is in terms of yeah. Um, and then on, I believe it's scheduled for June eighteenth. That'll be the Main Street demonstration project. Uh, and they've selected the area in front of this building, City Hall, uh, the crosswalk, and then connecting to uh, the Cracker Barrel Alley um, as a, kind of a demonstration project, bumping out the sidewalk in front of City Hall, also bumping out uh, the sidewalk um, you know, near Starbucks, shortening that uh, crosswalk, adding a landscape island to the center of the crosswalk, the pedestrian refuge. And then creating a uh, protected bike lane so the cars, the parking would be pushed back on the north side of the street and then a bike lane would be temporarily installed and then the, the sidewalk. So that, as far as I understand, will be the, the demonstration project. Uh, we're going to be working to try to get, this, uh, get some landscaping, get some trees donated from uh, a nursery, still in their uh, like five gallon buckets or something. Um, and uh, just to kind of show, use more than just cones and construction oh, and stuff great. to kind of show what you know, it could look like. And that would just be, I think, for the weekend. June 18th? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Is that a Friday? So they leave it on the weekend on Saturday. Saturday, I think. It's going to be a Saturday. It's going to be just for a certain time frame during the day. We have, we have a lot of support. We have to provide all the, a lot of different support pieces for them to make it happen. It'll be very interesting. Is there talk about structural soil for the new project on Main Street? The meeting? No. No, it was really more of a macro design meeting rather than I'm still getting that ten years out kind of thing. I hope hopefully not that far, but yeah, it's definitely related to the tip and grants and uh, I don't have I, I took a look at our website. Do you guys she mentioned website update. Was that mostly the, the map that's on there, or? Um, she, uh, Lily was wanting to get a bunch of uh, more photos from uh, Arbor Day oh, yeah. of that okay. nature, and she was going to work with Andy, and she's going to work with Andy and myself to give her thoughts as to what we should try to add to the website. Okay, great. Spruce it up a little bit, you know. It's just that Andy is really overrun, our GIS coordinator is really overrun tonight about everything, so. All right. Well, I definitely like to formalize the uh, the art for the art for trees mm -hmm. part. Yeah. Um, I think you know we could create that where businesses can request that you know they sponsor the uh, that golden tree sculpture yeah. for a month. Uh, and then when it's done, you know, plant in a tree because you know, there's at least five sites you know right on Main Street that could use a, either a cut down tree and a new tree or a, or a replacement. Yeah. Do you have any photos from the one that we already did, Tom? Uh, I'm sure Jody uh, from Thorns has one. I can reach out to her. Okay. Uh, I know there's that pic of the, uh, picture of the uh, mayor helping the plant. It's kind of blurry, but um, but I don't. I, I hope there's a good picture of the uh, mm -hmm. installed work by Robert Markey. Plug. Um, and I guess she invited someone from uh, Columbia Gas. She's. She, I'm going to reach out to uh, Dan Peggy, uh, or he's the, he's the gentleman that I deal with mainly in regards to any kind of Columbia gas work uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, 
I'm going to reach out to him to see if he will come to the meeting or they may send someone who is, uh, he's more of a hands-on in the field, uh, basically sort of like an operations person like I am. I don't know if they want to send him to come or they will send someone from their office. So he's very nice to work with. Um, I don't have any issues. I don't know, I, I, I wait. she's going to give you the dates that she would like to see. She said, I think she sent out a doodle poll. Did anybody get invited to a doodle poll? Mm -hmm. She said she's going to send out a doodle poll for all of us for the summer, trying to figure out what our schedule is going to be. So when they invite these folks, because she also, we also talked about inviting the, uh, the director to a meeting. Right. Oh, yeah. um, and she wanted to make sure that we were going to be, you know, at least there'd be a quorum and not a majority of it's a very good segue to your uh, report. Since that is on there. Yes. So, spring plantings. We have 40, 40 trees in a pen in the yard that are actually going to be going to have to be put up in accommodation of volunteers and. Scarlet oaks that we got are actually more manageable, so we have delivered some of those trees to Rob, to places where Rob wanted them, uh, with volunteers that he had organized. He's on vacation, he'll be back this coming weekend, so I'm gonna connect back with him and get the rest of the trees back to the ground. I have a few more trees, I have three more trees to pick up at Amherst Nursery, and then we'll have everything from that order we took last year. So I anticipate we should have everything to the ground for in about two weeks, I hope. I'll contact Rob I too because uh, my semester just ended. I have a okay. lot. I have a lot more time. I could go out okay. during the day. Yeah. Or the week. It doesn't matter. It, could it would be beneficial. Now, Rob was telling me that Amherst Nursery is pretty well cleaned out at this moment. They really don't have a lot of stock available, so um, we really need to sit down and actually create a list of the stock that we'd like to purchase. And actually, I need to make to work on a contract with Amherst Nursery so we can actually be tell him that we collect X, Y, and Z plant material uh, for the fall. And he said he'd be much, much easier to get more plant material, more diverse plant material for the fall. So if we need to expend, you know, we will need to expend that $25,000 that's in our budget that's sitting in there reserved for trees at the moment before June 30th. So that's kind of a pressing, pressing thing. Oh, how many trees do you anticipate? Probably about the same amount, 160. Yeah. Well, we, I, my suggestion would be if we're going to do this is to plant them all in the fall mm -hmm. and not have any remaining for the spring. Mm -hmm. so we don't, yeah, not, you, just want, you just want to encumber, get the invoice and encumber the funds right. by June 3rd. Yeah. Do, you, do, they need, do they need specific species for that to happen? Yeah. Yeah. Really, you do? You can't just do like a City auditor kind of likes to see what you plan. They like to mm hear. -hmm. We have a, our auditors are very strict. So you can do be, like like both, or you could like specify the type. I could. You could do ten of this, ten of that, ten of this, ten of that. But you, they have to. You have to identify what you're buying. Okay. You know size because it's going to have to be a, uh, a in three quotes. Okay. So I have to send this three quotes out to three different countries. And if, I, and if I specify that I want all grow bag, then most nurseries won't be able to, um, they'll, they'll give you no quote because most nurseries don't deal with grow bags. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, if they're on the state bid list, I think there's some flexibility for when you're on the state bid list. There, there is there is flexibility, but the procurement rules are still the same though because in order to encumber the, in order to use 25,000 that's in this year's budget mm -hmm. before it goes back to the general fund because it will get turned back in. You know, I think what um, so it's been a while since I spent a lot of money really quickly, but I think what I what I did to get not not because I had to get around it, but because I didn't have enough time to spend it and get all the quotes is that that I got a, an opinion from 
my, my purchasing office that was okay to go through the state bid list. Maybe it's different for me purchasing office. So there's probably a different set of standards, but that was that was how, because I guess the thinking was that, uh, that all the bidding had been done. Well, if you have, if, if Amherst Nursery is on complex, that's the actual procurement, that's the state procurement um, operational services division, which is part of the state, uh, the state of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They actually create this multi-blanketed contract that has contracts for everything. And as municipality, we can actually use that bid document to buy materials from vendors that are over ten thousand dollars without a standard municipal contract it's called the vendor cover sheet so the vendor cover sheet really is just saying that this these this company is selling these trees on this combines list and what i do is i have to make sure that because every time there's a vendor that is on the combines list they have to guarantee the state and the discount so i have to have the list price the discounted price and the total price for everything it's actually very simple. It's easier than a standard contract, which requires you to have three quotes, or if it's over $24,000, then you have to have three written quotes. It has to be in the central register. And then if it's over $100,000, it has to go into goods and services and sit out there for a few weeks. So the different level threshold of money. So the state bid list makes it really easy. The fact that we're not going to buy trees more than $24,999 is also easy for a standard contract because all I gotta do is get three quotes, three written quotes. It's very dense. You know, bid opening is to be the sign, blah, 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 and whoever wins the bid wins the bid. But they have to basically have, have the stock that we want. So that's why it's important to identify the trees we want and the type of container we want the trees to be in. Yeah, all right. Well, I think we can trust you to navigate the Chapter 30 B procurement law successfully, yeah. but I think, you know, our task would be to um, you know, at the next meeting then, uh, very, very quickly uh, prioritize any kind of uh, choices that we have to make, uh, perhaps based on some preliminary, you know, choices that you could bring us, uh, perhaps based on the success of the fall plantings that we have seen. Has there been... I think everything we purchased this fall actually is leafed out. The one tree, some of the trees that haven't leafed out are actually the fairwood trees. There's one that, I think there's one on South Street that uh, I'll have a look. Okay. So I've been watching them. Yeah. Uh, well, we have, we have water bags on all the bare root trees at this time, and then we're probably going to plug next week. And depending on the weather, put water bags on all the trees we planted last fall. And then hang door hangers out at the location. Multi people water them. If they don't, we'll. If I don't hear from folks, we'll just go mm -hmm. water the trees. So for the next meeting, can you bring us some just some advisory decision points on the prioritization of the of the order of the uh, uh, the trees yeah jay and rob and so we we'll have to all get together before the yes because these guys have developed a list of recommended tree species so uh, i'd like to go over that first and then actually come up with some recommendations well i think the way to start would be to see what the nursery has available yeah. at their list. Right, because that, but Rob said the list they have presently is not, is not that hot, but what they have available for the fall. What is he can get. Yes. What we need. Yeah. Can we get a, that list from you? Yes. I will, make, I will see if I can get that on the job. Okay. The big Lowe's is online. And the DPW director yeah, invitation. DPW director invitation. Um, that was something that I talked to Lily about the other day when we met. Again, waiting for the doodle poll to come out to try to figure out exactly uh, why everyone would be here. What people would need to have everyone here. So, again, she was going to send that to us via email. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one other thing I will be doing another public shade tree hearing in the near future. At 306 Chesterfield Road for a new driveway installation. So I met with the resident today. They're going to have to cut down probably about four to six trees that will require mitigation. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
have a draft of the yep. RFP, for lack of a better term. Uh, draft of the bid document. So, I've been working on this thing, and as I have to say, this is something that is a little foreign to me, the tree's not foreign, but bidding this kind of horizontal design services. So I've utilized um, assistance from uh, Assistance from Molly Freilisher from BCR. Um, assistance from uh, Andy Hillman, who is uh, Davey, um, from Davey Resource Group, who will probably be one of the companies that will get on this. So he's, he actually has a copy of this to kind of give us what uh, his take is on the estimate, so how much it would cost actually do the work that's not it's not a bidded document yet. Um, I put dates in here in the first the first page, but um, but those are not really held to anything. We can adjust those all. identifying a thousand planting locations. Yes. <clears throat> Do we want to have them identify kind of the uh, general shape or form or even species of the tree for any of those locations? No. Okay. Uh, I, I think I'm trying, I'm trying to make that as, uh, not, because I have not, I have not found any other inventories that actually ask to identify tree planting. So I, was, I actually came up with this criteria that I would be, you know, anyone has any suggestions or changes or additions would be great. But I wanted to try to keep it as simple as possible. You know, it's really about overhead utilities and making sure that the area is in the right away is at least four by four to accommodate a, a decent sized tree. Um, the underground utilities, we actually will identify those when we actually do whether we do the dig safe uh, to do the actual tree planting itself. So I'm not going to ask the vendor to identify our units so it would be uh, not cost, it would be cost for And plus your entire city would be marked up. Oh yeah, it would be, it would be, it would be, it would be they'd be asking the water department to pull the cards everywhere and they would go nuts. So. And then I actually uh, really kind of Toy around with the type of risk assessment that we should be providing, and I came up with the level two qualitative risk assessment. Um, Where are you? I'm sorry, I'm on the page. I, the pages aren't numbered yet. Welcome back. This is going to be on page uh, five. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Further the firm. So the, the uh, inventory will be a little, little more time consuming because of the level two risk assessment because it's not your standard level one, which is a drive-by assessment or a walk-around assessment, but that does not really capture, a level one assessment doesn't really, it only captures visual hazards, for example, hangers, uh, doesn't really go into very much detail. And so in order to put together a urban forestry management plan, I think for level two, what we should have. Um, level three is um, would be like a uh, resistant graph or uh, a son sonic tomography to the tree. You know, so that would be a further assessment. That's would not, that would not be good for this. I also, I also, I also ran that by Andy Hill from David Tree. And he recommended based upon the level of information we're asking for in the inventory that level two would be, would be normal. So Davy Tree actually has develop their own uh, qualitative risk assessment documents, which is good because it's telling me that they have it electronically. So the whole idea really is to actually, because we don't have the tree ID, we don't have any tree ID system here. So the work order system we have presently, you know, that identifies trees really by their location uh, an address. So 173 uh, North Maple Street, for example. And then Terry will assign the, 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 the 
computer will assign a work order number. But there is really no tree ID number. So in order to make this really work in GIS, we have to actually have them assign a tree ID number to every single tree. And then all the information, like the risk assessment, can be tied to that tree. So when you actually go to that tree on a GIS map, it'll be a drop down box. It'll have an identification and all the information will be there. Uh, and, you know, this, like I said, this is a draft and uh, it can be changed and added to. I just actually got a copy of one from Concord. And Concord. 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 <laughs> Hackett's RFP is really amazing. It actually talks about the historical nature of Concord, Hackett, and it also talks about, it's really just very specific, which is pretty amazing. So I'm going to wait for Andy's comments, because they are going to be the ones who are going to get on this. So. But what about the, go oh, ahead. Right. What if there's not a thousand plane communications? There's like, I think, uh, some language to Maybe in the contract, at least identify if they, if they can't identify a thousand, at least explain why they can't. Because what if there's only 600 uh, could be That's a good point, actually. I will talk to Joe about that. Or uh, if they're not within the one and a half, I mean, there's got to be a doubt, but if they're not within one and a half miles, then expand the search. Yeah, uh, yeah the one and a half mile. So the one and a half mile, I only have one copy of this. One and a half mile radius. Each one of these rings represents a half a mile, and I'll just pass it around. So the one and a half mile radius from basically King and Pleasant is the one area, and the other area is the Florence Center, uh, Maple and North Maple. So those two yeah. lines kind of actually cross each other, and they encapsulate the majority of uh, the urban the center streets. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't encapsulate leads. Um, but I'll just go ahead. There's four rings. Um, yes. what are the distances again? Half a mile each. Oh half a mile each. Half a mile each. Yeah. Um, what about the uh, what about identifying all the trees like in a forested area? Is that part of it? No. Is that no? Okay. No, I think we're just is there an exclusive where is that language that says, says that that, the, uh, the trees will be in the public right away. Yeah, I saw that, but what in the public right away in you know, out in the boonies is still tons and tons of trees. All right. Well, what if you? Uh, it says the center. The center is here. Well, that's for the sites to um, locate new ones. But so on, the on page well, four, page four, the last bullet at the top there. Tree locations must be accurate at the lot scale and appear correct from the view on high resolution. An online GIS map showing assessors, property lines, and house numbers on top of the current high resolution aerial photo. This data can also be provided in GIS format. So we're going to provide them with um, the actual assessors map so they can actually utilize them and actually have them the trees that are outside of each people's property. So, for example, uh, like Chesterfield Road, where it goes off into you know, they'll have to be able to generally identify the majority of the trees that are there based upon what they're seeing on their tablet. So if they're driving through the watershed lands, they'll just be like, pine, pine, pine. The watersh well, they're, it, it, they're, that's a good point because the watershed properties are a little different. Okay. So there is there is a differentiation between the public right of way and the watershed property. The watershed is owned by the Water Department. Mm -hmm. And they're actually not supposed to be doing drive by sections, it's just on ground. Mm -hmm. So to, to, do a, to, to do a level two quali qualitative risk yeah, assessment for every tree, you have to be on the ground and physically touch every single tree. Well, I guess that's, so that's what I mean. So uh, in the public right of way, yep. in, the more, in a rural area, they're still going to have to identify every single tree that's in the public, in the public right. right. And they'll have to use uh, they'll have to use the GIS measuring tool to actually measure between the assessor's lines, and they'll have to utilize that from the center of the roadway to capture uh, as much 
as they possibly can or how accurate they can. Because the property lines are very, you, you, they're not, they're not, you can't see them. Mm -hmm. You have to actually search for them. And each road is very different. So the assessor's map is really the best mapping tool that we have to do this. I see what you're saying, Todd. Like, you don't want them to spend a huge chunk of time just figuring out where they're killing the trees, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little, I'm concerned that a lot of their resources uh, are going to be spent, you know, counting trees that we could easily identify and just deal with from some other satellite or some sort of cheaper survey. So they're going to be on the ground in all the back roads counting every tree in the right of way. That's going to, I mean, that's when really we, I think our priority is to focus on more urban environment. Do you want to make a level? Well, we have we, the, the RFP isn't designed that way, and nor was the actual grant application. Mm -hmm. the grant application says we will survey it at 8,000 trees citywide. So, what happens, for example, um, going down uh, Fort Street, down to the meadows there? Yep. Um, there's like this chunk of uh, volunteers, basically, of uh, uh, Norway maples, and they're definitely bigger than an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. So, and they're closer than, well, what's the distance into the public right away, like 20 feet or whatever. It depends. Yeah, let's there. say, let's say it's 20 feet. So, what about something like that? I mean, those kind of aren't really street trees. No, they're not street trees, but they're still in the public right away. Okay, so, so they would be counted. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, everything, everything that was in the public right away would be counted. There's going to be trees that are missed, I'm sure, but I think generally speaking, we're going to capture the majority. Do we want to have more data for places that are near where people live and less data for places that are more remote? It's like basically count them, but don't do as much of a thorough job of counting them. You'd have to really, that. Like, they like two different geographic streams. Well, you, you would have to, you would have to divide the, have to do the same thing that you did with that thing there. Mm -hmm. But then that creates a problem because now you're cutting off a particular street at a particular location and not capturing all the data. I think, in my opinion, to do a, a complete uh, urban assessment of all our trees, I think we need to do a complete inventory of all of them. Well, I, I, I mean, I appreciate that, but I, I think it could to not only spend a lot of time out in areas that aren't, you know, a high priority for no other reason than there's tons of trees out there. Right. But number two, it could skew the data. So it's, I think in the report we need to make clear that we want, you know, we want to understand our urban forestry needs and, and, or, and um, uh, inventory separate from, you know, the, the gobs of you know, trees that are out in the more rural areas because it's going to skew our inventory of, you know, what we're, what we're actually looking at in the urban, in the urban areas. You mean like Birds Pit Road or something like that? Yeah. It could. Yeah. We could ask them for two figures. We could ask them for us, the whole city, which would be skewed, um, and then within the radi a certain radius of the city center. Yeah. yeah. Or could will will the information be reported by street or by you know what I mean? Could you sort it that way? Like we know we sort it that Bird's Pit Road is is full of trees, but which is good, but that's not people aren't walking along Bird's Pit Road necessarily. So could we sort it that way? Like remove I don't know very much about this kind of thing. Could we you know, could we correct for doing it that way? Yeah, as long, as long as there's at some point we can run analysis in areas that we want to run analysis on and not necessarily just count on the, you know, all the data in one big file. Mm -hmm. If we just want to focus on, you know, all right, well, what, what does Florence look like or what does this particular neighborhood look like? You know, we, we would we need the ability to, to focus in on that so that the data is not just showing that it's all white pines. Yeah, because that would be a, 
thing was just one map showing speed or one chart showing speeds of breakdown. Yeah. Like what what conclusions can we draw? Right. Yeah, they're going to say, you know, 50% of your street trees are white pines and, you know. But in reality, sugar though, rolls. they are street trees. So in my opinion, the whole city, the whole urban forest, whether it's on Sylvester Road or whether it's out on Northampton, they're all under, they're all my responsibility, I guess, the city's responsibility. So well, I'm not saying discount the data. I'm no. saying allow us to get more granular and look at certain areas and, and draw conclusions and right. management suggestions I'm based on I'm not familiar with the software programs that these companies use, so I don't know if we can do that or not. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you could select by street, you know, if you want to even by ward, by just selecting the streets you want to make. Because you want to be able to make more replacement decisions in place of the people that make That's true. So this is this is where our populations are, and in our populated areas, we know the following things about our tree camp. So it's all so it's cool that we because I can see where Rich is coming from because he is the tree warden for the entire city, so he's got like this entire view. I think we're thinking of a way to prioritize planting sites or strategies or species or management actions in a way to get more trees where more people. I think as a, as a shade tree committee member, you know, I think like, well, it's, it's nice that there's trees up in the watershed, but I don't see it benefiting downtown except for you get clean drinking water, which is kind of like a bad example. But but what you want to have is like, I guess we want to make sure we have a good argument for why we need trees near where people live. Well, yeah, well, just an example. Let's say um, they say, uh, you know, we, we're shy on a particular species overall. If you're just looking at data on a macro level, they're saying, well, you're really shy on a specific spe species. Well, all right, so we start planning that, but maybe one neighborhood has all of them. And, you know, so just to understand those, those differences, I think, is going to be important. And we can, you know, I think putting it in here as, uh, you know, a desire or, you know, a, a specification that we, you know, want to have the ability to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Just be a way to, to achieve that. And if they can't do it, they can't do it. Ability to manage, to sort the data, would that be the like, uh, And geographically, you know. Well, you will be able to do it geographically because you're going to end up having the GIS map. Mm -hmm. the GIS map is going to show you where all the trees are, here, all the tree data on a particular street. Sort of like the, sort of like the Google map, but a lot more classier, a lot more user friendly. Like a neighborhood report. How do you define neighborhood? Well, you can run. You can run. You can run reports, or you can carve out Excel spreadsheets from each one of those data points. But with, but you're asking them for a forestry management plan too, right? Yes. So I mean, those recommendations shouldn't necessarily just be based on on a macro scale. They should be more neighborhood specific. Like, like you, uh, this this is this is Jacoby's plan, and it's not neighborhood specific. It actually talks about the whole urban forest. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is a, there is reason to. I I see what you're saying. I think from a planting perspective, and but I do see also like to have a big macro. So if there's some pest, you know, you introduce pest. I mean, maybe we do need to go cut down all the white pines before blah blah comes down the road, you know? Or or to plan for future, you know, budgetary, you know, tree management right. pruning, you know? No, I get I get that, but but I'm not discounting the macro, but I'm saying we also you know, they need to, to say the last thing this neighborhood needs is another sugar maker. Right. Or right, whatever. Right, right. right. Would there be a way to create a template? And this is kind of like out of the box thinking to let people create their own neighborhood reports. Like if there was well, like I, I doubt it. I tell you what, what's going to happen is the GIS, the GIS map permission will not be public. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to view the map, you'll be able to open things up and look at them. But as far as creating and editing their that it's a protected system. Mm -hmm. So it's myself, Andy, have permission to actually adjust and change it. So you know, could you could you like choose on GIS, choose a quadrant, let's say, or yeah. whatever you want to call it. Can it generate, like, just a list, you, you know? It can generate a list, but the other way you can do it, too, is you can identify that, so, for example, let's pick a little street, uh, Dewey Court. Mm 
Yeah. It's a little street. You can actually look at Dewey Court on the GIS map. Look at all the identification numbers that are assigned all the trees and actually plug in all those numbers and you would you would actually get a, a sheet. You would okay. actually be able to look at all the trees and do the card all in the way maybe. Uh -huh. all, all the city trees. Uh -huh. So you could actually do the data, pull the data by street, I believe, through GIS. Yeah, as long as I'm recalling my GIS class a few years ago, um, as long as they input all the data thoroughly then we could then analyze it in lots of different ways. Um, by tree, by street, correct. by precinct, just depending on what layers are showing, which ones are prioritized. I, yeah, I was wondering if, um, if perhaps we want to ask in our RFP for whatever our top 10 things that we'd like them to identify, perhaps certain sections of the city or certain streets or I uh, didn't, didn't break it down, but if you no. broke down to 8,000 street trees within the city, the city mm -hmm. it's going to be functionally complicated. I mean, if that's the case, then we can do what Amherst did. And Amherst identified the streets that they wanted to have. If they, the Amherst did not do a complete inventory. They just did certain streets. But they identified them. They gave the information to the vendor and said, here you go. Mm -hmm. my, my goal, personally, is to do a complete inventory of mm -hmm. the whole city. Mm -hmm. Just we have to have a baseline to start with, mm -hmm. and then we can actually build upon that uh, going forward. And I think uh, because it's it, you know it's important it's important for me personally to actually know what the risks are that we have out there. Because mm -hmm. so I drive by all over the place and I see all kinds of trees, and I tell you what, where most of the risks are that involve actually trees that are in really terrible states, or really just old Sylvester, Kennedy, Audubon, Montague. Because we don't pay attention to that mm -hmm. because there's no sidewalk, there's no residences, but they can still have the same kind of impact if they fall based on some other tree falling off the South Street somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's for me, it's the, tr the tree. And I guess I didn't really, I mean, I've always known how dangerous or how dangerous trees can be, but after I took that tree risk assessment course last fall, it really shot it to ring home. Mm -hmm. Uh, how dangerous it is, and every time there's an article I find something's falling on someone, I clip it out and I hold on to it. Just kind of reinforces that we have to do a better job, and it, this is one way that I know that we're going to be able to do a better job. The other positive thing, too, is that the city just is in the process of working on the purchase of a new order. It's just going to be one of the big things in the city. A new one? A new one? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a public platform that's going to serve all different departments, including work order systems. It's going to be able to uh, print out permits, licensing permits for liquor licenses and for vendors, permits for the building department, work orders for us. Um, I don't think it's going to be able to actually digest any of the inventory material, but it's going to make our life actually producing work orders and material and testing a lot easier because it's, uh, it's user-friendly, unlike viewers, which is the very uh, Unfriendly to all the users. So that's another tool we're going to have. This will be kind of a standalone, standalone document. It's going to be integrated, a lot of the information will be integrated with iTree or the same fields that iTree has. So, you know, we're not going to be doing a tree inventory every year, obviously, but we need to find a way to actually be able to input data, update it, when we plant the trees, or remove trees. And that's really the whole goal. To have like a, a living document that kind of keeps, you know, it's not just a static document that says in 2016 we had 8,000 trees and you just do the math and now we have 3,000 trees. You know, it's going to be a document that's going to be moving constantly. Mm -hmm. So, just a matter of getting it updated. So, I, I, you know, this actually compared to the one I saw in Concord actually is not as, uh, Concord was very, it was specific in different different ways. Like they identified, for example, they actually took the level two qualitative risk assessment and they actually outlined what they took Davy Tree's information for Davy's risk assessment for the level two risk assessment and how they do the risk assessment and what the criteria are. They, and it, it's, it's like a 10 page document, it's huge. Um, but Concord also doesn't have 8,000 tree trees. 
Chicopee, this, this document here, Chicopee actually, They actually have, they actually, so Davy Tree actually did a total of 15,043 sites were recorded in the inventory. 8,950 mills were planting sites. Wow. 5,805 were individual trees, and 300, and they did 323 stumps as well. They were asked to identify stumps. So that's, you know, opposite of what we've asked for. We've asked for to identify, because our sampling, when we did our, our sample inventory two years ago, we came up with roughly, I tree came up with roughly about 8,000 street trees. Might be a little less though, because we were using, I think we were saying 20, we were doing 20 feet? 20. We were doing 20 feet off the right of way, which in some places is not correct, in other places it's correct. Um, so that's where we came up with 8,000 mark. Well, and in lieu of stumps, we're identifying choice locations. For yes, I, we're not doing, I know where the stumps are, because every time we cut those trees down, we break the stumps in there. When, you, when is this going to hit the street? Um, I'm actually waiting for a couple things. I'm waiting to, for Andy Hillen to get back to me on a cost of what the, a, a rough ballpark cost will be. Once I find that information, if it exceeds the amount of money we have, then I need to go and communicate with the mayor. Which that can happen pretty quickly. Um, the second piece is that uh, once the RFP is done, I need to actually get it to Joe Cook for him to review the procurement officer. So it could be my goal would be to put it out in about two weeks. I really, I really want this to be out by June, beginning of June. Because I, I suggested in here, you know, it's a suggestion that it should be done within six months' time. Yep. Um, I don't know if that's enough time now, enough time. I'm hoping David Tree will kind of give me a little guidance on their thought process on that, so. Yeah, Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, please take it home. If you think yeah. of anything, just you send me an email, your thoughts. You know, like I said, this is something totally new to me, so I've never written one of these before, so having other communities. And actually, Molly Farlisher was really awesome. She helped me a lot. Great. So. Cool. Good. Thank She's you. a great resource. Yes, she is. <clears throat> All right, Jay. You've got 20 minutes. <laughs> well, the three of us haven't gotten together yet, but we've all got tree lists. The limiting factor to any list we put together is what we're going to get, be able to get from the nursery. So that's really our limiting factor. So, so then again, I'm sorry. I said the limiting fact, I mean, we can put together any tree list we want. I think Cornell has really the best one that I've seen. They also categorize trees according to tolerance for salt or pollution. Yeah. That sort of thing. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And I think ours should also have space for, uh, you know, good trees for certain conditions, not just salt, but, you know, under the power lines, yeah. you know, what, what, what can we plant there so this is not a barren yeah. row. Um, and at some point we're going to have to include the planning board into this discussion because ideally that will be applicable to the planning board rules and regulations for new construction, although that's limited, it should be consistent. Did you, did you talk about the non-natives? Species. No, that does make the list. It was interesting. Sure. It was really interesting. It was thought provoking. Um, I don't want to be kind of wrong anymore. It'd be cool if we could make some. And here, here I'm like native non-invasive, native, native non-invasive. But the um, University of Oklahoma professor, the North Dakota, South Dakota professor from South Dakota, he was he was making the case that because of globalization and you know they could do raising of biological barriers that we should plant tree species that had some unique resistance to pests from other countries. That it made sense to just assume that it was going to happen and then try to plant correctly. <coughs> Which is, you know, that's a bit philosophical argument. Well, I've always felt that way. I don't, I don't really adhere to the 
only native planting because there's a lot of stuff around that isn't native and it's been used for years. It's actually better than natives for screen trees. So, so you guys are going to meet, <coughs> excuse me, meet again? And well, I think what we need to do is, in order to speed things along, as we're doing the, the selection for the trees that we want to get from the Amherst Nursery. We can see what's available out there and put the our own mm -hmm. picture of this. Just for request, sorry, go ahead. No, please. Um, just for requesting, so I, I'm, I'm a little confused. So <coughs> is this also a list um, that's just recommended, like we're amending the recommended list? Or is it a list of what we want to get. I think it's both. Both. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And it's also what some people have to do. Yeah. Well, I think our, our immediate goal is to get the stuff set for the procurement right. in the spring. But long term, I think the list needs to be codified. I mean, it needs to be, in essence, law because it's going to be integrated into whatever ordinance we can create, and it also should be integrated into the planning board rules. I mean, at some point, it needs to be a, like an official adopted. But again, what I'm saying is the limiting factor that I, to that is what's going to be available. Yeah. And that's usually but more that's, limiting. But that's going to change year to year and vendor to vendor. And as we, you know, but I don't think it should limit, you know, what we, what we say are the, the myriad of species and whatnot that, that are on the list. Year to year, what we get off that list may, may differ. But everything that we get, no matter on the year-to-year -year changes, is going to be on the list. Right. Yeah, there could be like an asterisk after the ones that are either more easily or more or less likely to be available. Who's working on the list again? Jay, Andrew, and Rob. Oh, Rob. Can we set a, a date next week? Do you have some flexibility during the day? I can. Anything else on that? Or we're no, I think we all have to do it. All right. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on the, the guidelines? We already have those written up. We do? Yeah. As a city? Not as a city. Specifications are a bit. I mean, we can put together a package. No. But again, I think this will be something that. Permits can reference. So, um, you know, when a developer is mandated to put in trees on property or whatnot, they can, you know, we can say per, you know, these guidelines. Yeah. So it's going it's to be something I think that's going to be more than just DPW adhering to it. Be the you know, private private sector adhering to as well. And that could help us frame conversations of when there's violations, which is. Yeah. You know, so this, this is Cornell. I have one that I've written for Smith. So there, there are some good ones out there. There's some not so good ones also. The work's been done already. Do you have any thoughts on that, Rich, or should we move on? On the ordinance or regulation? Uh, well, we're still on the uh, yeah the guidelines. We can move on to the ordinance and regulations if we're ready. Oh uh, no, I don't have any thoughts on it. I kind of I agree with Jay. I think that there's a lot of guidelines out there, and I think we need to just find which ones work for us the yeah. best. I think is really what it wants to. I've narrowed it down to two, basically. For me, I'm sure you just got some. So 
for the guidelines, in terms of how they're categorized, is it by tree species, is it by soil type, by uh, habitat? Like what, what well, Cornell is good because they do it in all of those categories. Uh -huh. They'll do it by tolerance for salt, mm -hmm. tree height, size, soil conditions needed. We'll only accept Ivy Lee guidelines. <laughs> Cornell, Cornell has done a lot over many years of research. And so they're probably the best in the country, I would say. Do any of the guidelines include any uh, anticipation of climate change? Uh, Is it? I don't know how we include that. Well, it's mostly percentage of species, really, I think, right? Like there's recommendations for yeah. total percentage of one species. Yeah, but yeah, I guess the guidelines are usually site-specific. Right. Yeah. policy would be good. I'm thinking right. about that Union of Concerned Scientists report that came out 10 years ago, right? I believe it. You know, that showed all the New England states sort of oh, yeah, drifting yeah. down the coast yeah. and, you know, what was it? All many of the beaches, birches, and maples may not be here to the extent that they are. And so that, that that that's only by the end of the century. It's going up the coast. Yeah. So it's southern, more southern trees is happening. Yeah. Might be worth maybe including that. Just notation we're aware that climate change conditions could affect um, species there's some, good, there's some good research going on that now most of us fell at Smith is doing some good research on mm -hmm. just trees that he's noticed mm -hmm. around botanic gardens that maybe weren't invasive before and becoming invasive now because the temperature's risen, mm -hmm. you know, three or four degrees and now establish themselves in the native mm -hmm. environment. And also some tree species that would be better for planting mm -hmm. nowadays. So there is research going on in that. And we can include yeah. some of that information. I don't know if it's going to be specific to species, tree species, but kind of a, in the rule. You know, one, one of the problems we have here is we get, you know, we can try and plant trees a little further south from here, but like we got 20 below zero several right. times last year. Right. And that's going to kill out a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah. Even though we get the hot too. Mm -hmm. we, we try that at Smith. We do a lot of experiments with mm -hmm. trees that are borderline. See what happens. With <laughs> All right, well, we'll move on to the ordinance uh, and uh, public safety protection. I just printed out the um, last February, March citizen forester uh, document that kind of talked about developing a local. Um, sorry, I didn't go very far. Thank you. <laughs> developing a local uh, tree ordinance uh, just to get us kind of thinking uh, on it from a general point of view. The second part uh, gets into it in a little more detail and I just you know encourage you over the next month or so to go back to your email and click on some of the, the links and start looking at what these uh, documents, uh, what these ordinances can be. On the bottom of the first page I just uh, asked some general questions. Uh, you know, what are the goals of the community? What are our needs? What are we trying to accomplish uh, with this ordinance? Uh, I don't know if we wanted to take some time now and go over you know some of that in general, or if this is really synced up more to the inventory, and we should just be thinking generally about this and then waiting for the inventory to kind of direct us a little bit more. Um, open the thoughts uh, on that, and you know, before we delve into actually, you know taking other examples throughout the Commonwealth and creating Northampton's version uh, of it. I uh, just wanted to make sure that we all get on the same page and if we should wait till we see the inventory or kind of what, what do we think we want to accomplish with uh, public shade tree protection ordinance. Let's go to 
Yeah. yeah. Yes, good. You know the links too. It's, you know she she uh, linked up um, on their website. They have a lot of the um, on page two. It says uh, you know the ordinances are listed on their website, so you can go and kind of see. And they are you know they're generally the same, but there's definitely some differences. And you know we can make this uh, what we want it to be within the bounds of Massachusetts law. Um, we gotta get past. It would be nice to actually have an ordinance that actually ties everything together. You just, as we all know, we're kind of all across the map here. And a lot of it is because they've been, the planning department has driven, has been in the driver's seat. It's not really ever come from each other. It was the primary responsibility for public changes all these years. You know, it's just used in jail chapter 87. So, um, and now, you know, the nice thing is, is that we have the ability to set policy um, at executive by executive order, so we can set policy on how we actually remove public shapers and what the mitigation factor is. Of course, Amherst has the same issue. They have policies and they're actually being challenged by residents instead of actually being an ordinance. So if it's an ordinance and it's, that's what it is and that's the end of it, there's no challenge. It would be nice to actually have everything in sort of like one bucket to deal with the trees. So every time something comes across someone else's desk, it triggers a review. All we have to look at the home ordinance. How does that, you know, how does that fit in with the project that I'm actually uh, going to be putting together? Something to hand it to developers and say, here you go. This is our ordinance. This is what we have. These are the rules. Either it's lit lime or go build your building somewhere else. I, I don't really know if um, waiting for the ordinance, I mean, waiting for the inventory would really, I don't, you know, we're not asking them to talk about homegrown ordinance at all. We're just actually asking them to actually compile data and give us an overall report at the end. Um, so I think this, it might be good to kind of read this. I, I already, I've already read this once already when I received this in the, in the email, but, and actually, Try to come up with some ordinance recommend, some recommendations for change. You know, during this calendar year, that we can actually bring forward to the to the mayor's office to get his endorsement. You know, because the treaty inventory takes six months. That's so you know six months down the road from when I've worked on this at all. But it's also up to. You know, I can't. I you know need all of your assistance. Obviously, I can't do all this by myself. It's impossible. Well, I think, I'll, you know, I'll take the lead on actually writing the new ordinance uh, just based on input. And I think there's really two things we want to do, and you just kind of touched on them. One is the ordinance itself. And then two are perhaps a, a package of additional recommendations or changes to existing, mostly zoning law and permitting law, just to incorporate you more into the process and sink into uh, the ordinance that we put forward, and then the third thing are the, you know, the street tree list and the guidelines that we can reference, as, you know, from the law, but we can change a little bit more freely without going back and, and changing it with the city council. So those are those are to me are the three things that, um, you know, and they're all kind of synced together. Um, so I think the Thinking about the ordinance, you know what we wanted to accomplish, and then we can worry about the how. But you know, over the next month, you know, feel free to send me an email on kind of what you think these or this ordinance should do. I think the sinking you into the development review process is something that's a little bit more complicated. And that gets us back to you know kind of one thing that we started on, looking at all those ordinances and making sure that they cross-reference, and that that'll be a little more difficult of a package to put together, but. You know, getting this to a, a draft point within, you know, by the fall would be, you know, my goal. I, I remember when we were starting to look at these last May and June, um, and there were quite a few to sort through. Um, I think, Terry, you had provided us with a list of all the ordinances that mentioned tree. Mm -hmm. um, as, as we're, are, are you 
envisioning drafting a completely new ordinance or making a request that we adapt or revise a current one? Both. Both, okay. But I think starting with creating the new ordinance, I think that's the key part that'll, you know, locally empower the tree ward based on our needs and then creating that package of changes that uh, in essence this incorporates the tree board into the review process of, of projects. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, there was a house built on Massasoit Street, 86 Massasoit Street, and they actually got a building permit, you'll ask me how, without having a driveway permit. So and when you pull a permit out to build a house automatically, uh, it puts under 2,000 square feet, there's no site plan review, you need to actually go to the Department of Public Works before you can put a shovel on the ground and get a, get a driveway permit. So I actually drove by the house multiple times during the winter, looking at them. Not, it didn't even register in my head to be truthful. I, I did see a huge pile of soil though against one of the trees, and it's Massasoit Street, so the street line there is kind of, it's funky, depends where you are. So uh, about two weeks ago, all of a sudden I get a driveway permit for 86 Massasoit Street. So, the build, unfortunately, the building department, there was an oversight. They didn't, when they issued the permit, they didn't give him the packet that says that now, in order before you do anything, you have to have a driveway permit because DPW has to approve your driveway as it enters the street, which then triggers my review of the same public shade tree. Well, there are obviously There's, two public shade yeah. trees there. One of them is a red maple, and the other one's an American elm. Oh, no. And the American elm is very healthy. So, again, one of those instances where we have such a um, siloed, siloed approach to this because you know we need to make this ordinance because this is happening. We need to make this ordinance because this is happening, and this is how planning is kind of marched along because of the different types of um, site plan review that's required. So, just another example of how important it is to put these put a general ordinance in one package that can just be delivered. Really and it's not a unique phenomenon. Every municipality no. operates in silos, but yeah. you know the, the hard part is to get that cross pollination at some point and consistently and embedded right. into the into the law. And I, uh, Louis Asworth's been very good about contacting me about all kinds of different issues. So that you know he apologized for the oversight and oversight in his department, but you know again it just reiterates to me how important this is actually mm -hmm. to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Just a lot of ground cover, and there's really not there's not enough staff. I think that's really the biggest problem. There's not enough staff to go on my end for all the inspections, between the driveway inspections, the tree inspections, and, mm -hmm. you know, the trench permits that come out. I mean, it's you know, every time a Columbia gas can build a trench permit, I try to take bank and after a while actually look to see where they're working. Because again, their trench permit map stinks. So they say they're working on the street, but lo and behold, Jay's calling me and say, hey, you know they're gonna dig a big hole next to an elm tree. You know, if it wasn't for Jay, I wouldn't have known they would have dug the tree up. The roots would have been all severed with an excavator. And so that's, luckily, we've, we found out, you know, we've kind of created our own network. So but we need to have a much broader governing piece of document that says that this, if you have a building permit, this is where you go. And then from there, you can look at a flow chart. Mm -hmm. You just follow it around. Mm -hmm. you know, do you have any big trees around? No. Go to the other one over here. Okay. You have big trees? Yes, you must go to the park board and work on the tree board. Do you have any big trees? No. Are you telling the truth? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I, I so, that's, so that was just my, my recent experience, you know, so uh -huh. that's kind of. So know. in that case, um, there, are they requesting a driveway? They are. They were requesting it. They were requesting a driveway that went right over the roots of both trees, right over the roof flare. Well, there's not a lot of room. What can you do in that case? Uh, well, what we've done is we've made them actually redesign their driveway. The red maple actually is in severe decline, so it's going to be. You really couldn't. It really was so overshadowed by the elm that the canopy, its dead canopy, was up in the elms lower part of the canopy. So after it leafed out, I can really tell. So it's it's a hazard. So that's going to be that's going to come down, and they're going to basically take their the trees in the corner of the lot, houses over here. They're actually going to take the driveway, bring it down, and curve it from the house and bring it out this way. And then I'll make them air spay the root system of the elm, and then the roots that were damaged that are beyond repair that are at the 
top, we're going to have to carefully cut them. Something else I can do with them because they actually grow over that the surface for the cement feet be based on. Them. So it's kind of you know, but there's there's no there's no real there's no mechanism. I can't find I could find the individual and I could find him for damaging public trees, but it's also not his fault he didn't know they were public trees because right. the building department failed to notify the public works department. You find it and, and there's no ordinance. <laughs> there's no ordinance concerning protection of trees during construction either. Right? No, the I what I the only thing that I do is I actually enforce the ANSI standards. Right. So that's how I, you know, whenever we that's why site site plan review is really important for me to be involved and driveway permits. So if you the, the thing that doesn't that I don't see is when people get building permits that don't require new driveways, that don't require anything, and then they're actually doing the work and they actually damage a city tree, I will then, I'll never be able to know because I don't get any notification that there's actually a building permit issue. You know, for, for someone to actually do an addition on our house and they actually have a, a truck out in the street and they're actually booming in a whole bunch of sheetrock and they're going right through two city trees and they snap all the branches off and then they drive away and some elderly neighbor will say, hey, somebody broke a bunch of branches on a tree. I, you know, I can, it's, it's how we find out. Mm -hmm. Or contractors back over city trees that happen over on Olive Street. There's a little materials to the house, concrete truck back right over a city tree on the other side of the street. I, I made the person replace the tree. But, you know, that, at that point, I wasn't a tree work. So, it was just different experience. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not trying to believe it. Just tells me how important it is. Yep. So. That might be a worthwhile uh, layer on the GIS map. Back over city trees. Damaged trees. <laughs> due to I think Andy's going to quit if I ask him. It's really <laughs> All right. So again, just um, take a look at that. Uh, look at the look at the um, draft order. Or look at the ordinances on the uh, on the website, uh, and uh, you know, feel free to send me any thoughts on which ones you think are the best, their priorities, and uh, we can continue this with a, a rough draft uh, in, in, uh, over the summer. Volunteer intake form. Okay. Will we, um, did she send it to everybody? Or she did send something to me because I, uh, after the last meeting, I did create a spreadsheet. Did I share that with everybody? The volunteer intake the volunteer, form? No, not the intake form. The um, With all the people's no, uh, specific request, uh, specific skill set and stuff? Yeah, no, I didn't share that with you. I just shared all the photos from Arbor Day. But I created all um, on Drive a spreadsheet with all the volunteers, according to the public survey, who said they'd be interested in helping. Um, yeah. yeah, I saw yeah. that, but it didn't seem. I didn't open it up. Okay, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> sure then after that, Lily sent a great um, intake form that the mechanics of which I didn't look into, but it, it sounds like everything would be go directly to a spreadsheet. So I just asked her, uh, are we going to be operating on two different spreadsheets, or should we sync them? And she did say we should sync them. So I just wanted to add that because there there have been those things done since our last meeting. So the form is, there is a form completed? Uh, we only drafted one, yep, an intake form. Yeah, so the Google, uh, I thought she sent it to everybody. Yep. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> there. Yeah. All right. Gas leaks, no follow up at this time. Other business not reasonably. Oh, what did I check on? Uh, oh, the sniffer? Yeah. Um, what I can tell you about, I, I spent a little time looking at that and watching videos of these people who are doing. There's like the pro, there's a million different things. You know, I'm not a gas leak expert. And there's like, you know, you can buy 
50 different kinds of tools from $40 to whatever. And the other thing is um, it's just because you have a, the gas leak could be like over here and it follows, it could just follow the, the pipe and come up somewhere else. So just because you have a, just because you have a tree that dies here doesn't mean the gas leak is there, you know? So I, I don't know, like I kind of stopped because I was like, well, what's like, it gonna, what's it gonna tell us? exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's ones you can put right down in a little crack. There was this guy with the video with this swimming, this, this sandbox cover and sucking air out. It's kind of interesting, but, but I was like, I, you know, this is, I, if we're more interested in this, we need to talk to somebody who knows something about this technology, because he could spend, you know, it's, it, it would be a rabbit hole like on the internet, yeah. you know. I, I just don't have enough would background. Would the representative it, so. from Columbia Gas? be a good person or would they actually I mean the tricky thing is is it's not you know it'll follow you know. Well, yeah so it can be you know you could tell where the leak was yes it was coming up but you couldn't tell Where's the where, leak? Where the leak in the pipe is. Follow it. I don't know. Maybe they know. Well, that's what these guys were doing with the sandbox cover, and you know, and I don't think we want to get into that. Well, I think Dave and that trouble because you see them digging up in the road, and then nope, it's not here, and then they dig another hole. Yeah. Yeah, I got to test that. Look at Pine, Pine and Maple Streets. They, they inadvertently forgot they had an old service there, their main, so they've actually dug six four by four holes in the brand new street. To, to try to basically patch it and see it. Uh -huh. So. Does the gas sniffer require any? No. 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 But there's literally there's ones for one for like thirty nine ninety five. You know that you can just stick down in in a crack or a manhole cover. But that doesn't mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. You look on some of these gas truck vans that have these hoses hanging out. It yeah. looks like a. Oh, yeah. A funnel on the bottom, yeah. that's what those are. Oh, really? They just drive and monitor, and when they find a spike, they stop. Oh, I thought that was the ground. Yeah, yeah. That. Interesting. Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> All right, Lily's not here, but basically what I have for her is working on updating the website with the help of Andy and also include a section on art for trees. Send out doodle poll for summer availability of us for our meetings and invite the new DPW director to a tree commission meeting. Uh, Todd asked Jody from Thorns for a photo from art for trees and await feedback from commissioners on ordinance, language, or edits, etc. Uh, Rich, invite Columbia Gas to a tree commission meeting. Um, plant 40 trees in the next two weeks. <laughs> um, begin contract with Amherst Nursery. Uh, ask John for John there for a list of available trees. Um, and are you attending the hearing at 306 Chester Field Road? Yeah, it hasn't even. I, there's so It's upcoming. It's going to be sometime in June, probably. Oh, in June, okay. And then send out the RFP by the end of June. Uh, Jen helped Rob with tree planting. Uh, Jay, Andrew, Rich, and Rob, I lumped all this together, uh, create tree species list, adapt planting guidelines, and meet for next week. And then for all of us to do two things, uh, review the RFP and let Rich know of any edits or suggestions, and then review the ordinances uh, according to the links that Molly's article has been assigned with. Citizen Forester. Um, that's that. Okay. Anything else? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.